Hello, everyone. Uh, finally, I'm back in Boston, and I am happy to say that we're pretty much set up to transition into a fully online platform. Um, the, you know, obviously, the, the, the one big change is that you're going to have to be doing um, some extra work on your end um, in terms of reading. Uh, so what I recommend is at the beginning of each week, now this, this, uh, this first week, um, I'm going to take uh, week, this week and next week and sort of combine them into one two-week block. Um, the homework for sections 4.1, 4.2, I'm extending the, um, the due dates on that. And uh, the plan for this upcoming week or the current week is section 4.3 and 4.4. Um, before I talk about the content that we're going to be covering, um, one of the one of the components that I'm adding to uh, to the course is uh, let me go over here to Blackboard. In each uh, in each week folder, I'm adding or I have added uh, another uh, another folder. So if you go into Instructor Perspective, you'll see a folder. Each week we'll have one of these folders called Eric's Video Solutions. Uh, so basically what I'm doing, and I've done this for a, a, a couple of you already, so there's a few videos posted. Um, basically, I'm, I'm able to record like Khan Academy style videos uh, to answer specific homework questions. So if you send me a question on WebAssign uh, directly from the homework, I can, um, I can uh, record a video, uh, post it. I, I record a video, put it on YouTube, and post it. Uh, so, um, while you're doing the homework, before you send me a question and, and wait for my response, the, you, you definitely want to look to see if I've already posted a, a video of that question that you're about to ask. Now, if I haven't, of course, I'll record one, post it for you. Uh, okay, so uh, I think that's going to be a big help in terms of making up for that, you know, that loss of face-to-face -face time. Um, because you know, every every day we meet, we we definitely st always start off the day going over homework questions. So this will sort of uh, hopefully simulate that as best as possible. Now, uh, current um, oops, the current material um, covering section four point three and four point four. So. 4.3 is is more or less an extension of 4.2. So over here, this is what we did in 4.2. We calculated area under a curve by taking the limit of uh, by taking uh, rectangles and the limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity allows us to uh, to calculate the exact area under a curve. Um, basically, we're using, you know, we had used the fact that the area of a rectangle is base times height. And so this, let me use green here, this is the height of each rectangle, and the delta x is the base. So height times base, and delta x, like in, in, I took a little snapshot from our textbook. So this, this right here is delta x. In this case, delta x. Uh, in this particular diagram, delta x is two fifths. So basically, the width of the base of each rectangle is two fifths. Now, um, so this is what we've already covered. This is section 4.2. Over here, this is section 4.3. Now, the only difference is <coughs> we have this notation here as opposed to as n goes to infinity. This is called a Riemann sum. Um, really, the only difference is with Riemann sum, you'll see, let me get rid of some of this. With a Riemann sum, you'll see here, there's a delta x. That's the width of each rectangle. And it's constant. Each rectangle has the same width. And as the number of rectangles gets larger, the width of each rectangle gets smaller and smaller. Um, but there's no reason why the rectangles have to be 
uh, all of the same width. And so in section 4.3, the Riemann sum is introduced. And it's basically saying the area is given in the same way, the limit of uh, uh, more and more rectangles being used to approximate uh, the area under a curve. But the width of each rectangle, <coughs> excuse me, doesn't necessarily have to be the same. And so this, this notation here, this uh, looks like the double absolute value bars. This doot doot delta doot doot. This is called the norm. And what the norm is, the norm of a partition. So a partition is taking uh, like one big interval and slicing it up into smaller sub intervals. A partition is just taking one big thing and splitting it up into smaller things. In section 4.2, we took the interval A to B and we split it up into equal sub intervals, all of the same width and that width we call delta X. Now in 4.3 in the Riemann sum is saying, okay, well, uh, though delta X does not have to be constant. It could be variable. There could be a different delta X for each interval, or there could be a different width for each rectangle. That's why over here on the right, you see it's not delta X, it's delta X sub I. That's the width of the ith interval. So you'll have delta X1 is the width of the first interval. Delta X2 is the width of the second interval. We're not actually going to be, <coughs> excuse me, we're not actually going to be using different values, but this is more, this is more like the theoretical side of things, just saying that, okay, well, the, the width doesn't have to be equal. And this, so once you have a partition, and once you've taken one big interval and split it up into smaller intervals, the width of the largest interval is called the norm. And that's, that's, that's this symbol down here. The norm of a partition is the width of the largest sub interval. And so what's happening over here in this limit, instead of saying, and it, it's sort of two ways of saying the same thing. On the right, this n goes to infinity. That's saying as the number of rectangles goes to infinity. And over here on the right in the Riemann sum is saying, okay, as the width of the largest interval gets infinitely small. So if the largest interval is getting infinitely small, then all the other ones are getting infinitely small, which is equivalent to saying n goes to infinity, number of rectangles goes to infinity. Now, what you'll read about in, um, in section 4.3 and 4.4 is the definite integral. So if you look up here on the top in this definition box, and again, this is copied right out. I just took a screenshot right out of our textbook. In section 4.1, we talked about antiderivatives. And so this, this symbol here, this notation is the antiderivative of a function. It's basically saying, here's a derivative. What is the function who gave, like what, what, what functions give you this as a derivative. Uh, so for example, if we say, what is the antiderivative or indefinite integral? Remember those two terms are interchangeable of two X DX. That's saying, okay, what, what functions, when you take their derivative, do you get two X? And that's any function of the form x squared. Because according to the power rule, if you take the derivative of x squared, you get 2x. But since the derivative of a constant is 0, any function that looks like this, x squared plus a constant, if you take its derivative, you get 2x. Okay, so that's section 4.1, antiderivatives. In section... 4.3 and 4.4, now, now we're talking about the definite integral. And you'll see the little a and b. So with the definite integral, if we were to say the integral of 2x 
dx, let's say that's a 1 and a 3. What this is saying is, th this symbolically represents the area under f of x equals 2x between 1 and 3. So if you look at the graph, uh, 2x looks something like this. Maybe it's a little steeper. Um, here's 1. Here's 3. And so what this definite integral represents would be this area. Area under the graph, under the curve. So not the best 3 down there, but this is the best I could do. Um, so when you see, these are called the limits of integration. So upper limit is three, lower limit is one. So when you have limits, we call this a definite integral. And <coughs> one of the big theorems that we're going to be, well, I mean, obviously it should be obvious from the name, the fundamental theorem of calculus, that it's important. Um, now, our book refers to this as the fundamental theorem of calculus. And then there's a second fundamental theorem of calculus. I posted a number of Khan Academy videos and in the Khan Academy videos, Sal Khan refers to uh, our fundamental theorem as the second and our second fundamental theorem as the first. So it don't, um, I just, I just wanted to throw it out there just to make sure it wasn't confusing. Okay, so what you're going to read about the, the fundamental theorem of calculus. This is all about area, finding area. This is like when we transitioned from chapter one to two. And in chapter one, we found uh, actually in the first section, in section 2.1, we found the derivative of a function using limits, using the limit definition. The limit is delta x goes to zero of f of x plus delta x minus f of x all over delta x. The long way. <clears throat> then we establish those shortcut rules, power rule, product, quotient, chain. And that was a much more direct way to obtain the derivative of a function. This is the uh, integration sort of counterpart to that. The fundamental theorem of calculus will allow us to calculate area much, much quicker than using the summation, the limit of the summation, the limit of the rectangles um, that was uh, the topic in, in section 4.2. And then there's the, <coughs> excuse me, the second fundamental theorem of calculus is um, showing that these two these two operators, the, the, the derivative and the integral, are mm, sort of inverses of each other. So the derivative of an integral, not exactly, they, I don't, informally, we could say they cancel each other out. It's not exactly canceling out, but, you know, it's not like a square and a square root, or maybe I should, a better example would be a cube and a cube root. Um, because those are inverses of each other, inverse functions of each other. Uh, but it's it's similar to that. But definitely the 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 first the the theorem four point nine, the fundamental theorem of calculus. That's that's um, that's huge moving forward. It's basically going to be part of every section for somehow related to every section uh, for the rest of this semester. Mm, half of calculus two, all of calculus three. Uh, it's a big one. Okay, so I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, and this was this video was not meant to be like a full summary of the two sections. I want you to uh, please read the two sections of the textbook. Go through the examples. Uh, I posted PowerPoint notes. I posted um, I don't know six or eight. Khan Academy videos that align with the uh, the two sections um, for this week. And you have my cell number. When you have questions in the homework, 
send the question through WebAssign. But again, I don't get those notifications directly to my phone. So if you send a question on WebAssign, just send me a quick text. Hey, Eric, I just, uh, I just posted a question on WebAssign. Could you please make me a video? Um, I will um, do my best to get those videos done same day. If not same day, the next day. And not the next day after you post the question on WebAssign. If you don't text me, I probably won't see it. So as soon as I get a text or an email saying, hey, Eric, I posted a uh, question. Can you send me a video? As soon as I get that notification, then I will, uh, I'll do my best to have it to you within 24 hours or so. Okay. Um, it's going to be a little tough. Uh, I'm, I'm sure transitioning to online, um, but I will do my best and I'll do my best to meet your needs. So just reach out as often as you need. And um, yeah, that's about it. Good luck. And I look forward to your questions.